coming crisis. But why are we so divided and what will it take to fix it? To answer that crucial question, I'm joined today by a very special guest. Professor Michael Sandel is uh, described as a rock star political philosopher at Harvard University. His videos attract millions of views on YouTube. His 2020 book, The Tyranny of Merit, calls for a re-examination of notions of merit, of privilege and individual liberties, and in the process sheds a lot of light on possibly the most far-reaching political phenomenon of the last decade, the rise of populism and the decline of liberal democracy. That's as true of the United States in many ways as it is certainly true of this country at the moment. Professor Sandel, welcome to the India Today Conclave. Wonderful to have you. Rajdeep, thank you so much. It's great to be with you. Okay, let's start with the with the question that troubles many people, the seeming crisis of liberal democracy. This is not just Rahul Gandhi saying it at the moment. Lots of academics in academic environments say it in a more complex manner that democracies in several parts of the world, liberal democracies on the retreat, and uh, are seeking explanations for it. You seem to put it in certainly in the tyranny of merit, partly to the failure of meritocratic elites and their inability to put what you call the common good above their exaggerated sense of self. You want to explain that right at the outset to an Indian audience where it is the so-called Latians elite, what the Modi government calls the Latians elite, the children of old elites and privilege, that are under attack in this country, much as America's East Coast elites are, is, are they responsible in a way, their failures, for the failure of liberal democracy and the rise of populist autocrats? My answer, Rajdeep, may require some explaining because it may not be popular here. My answer is yes. Liberal elites, and mainstream political parties who governed for 40, 50 years missed the rising anger and resentment of a great many people who felt excluded, who felt they had no voice, and who felt looked down upon by liberal, meritocratic, technocratic, elites, well-educated elites. Let me begin by one seemingly strange quote from Donald Trump when he was campaigning in the primaries in 2016. He won a primary election in one state and he said at his victory speech, I love the poorly educated. Now, to the ears of liberal elites, that seemed very strange a strange thing to say. But he, like many authoritarian populist figures, understood the politics of grievance and resentment and was therefore able to ride and to cultivate and tap into a sense of backlash against the, the reigning political parties and liberal elites, and we are seeing this in countries around the world. So you're saying that the failure of the progressive elites, and you're saying they failed, yes. has led to anger and resentment among those who felt left out. Yes. And what we are seeing today is the revenge in a way yes. of the working class uh, in, in the United States of groups within this country who felt they were not being given their due or were being looked down upon or looked with condescension yes. by the liberal elites. Is that what you're saying? Yes, and I, there are two dimensions to this backlash. One of them is a sense of being looked down upon by well-educated, well-credentialed, hubristic elites who believed that their success was their own doing, the result of their education, and by implication, 
that those who struggle must deserve their fate too. That's the harsh way that meritocratic attitudes towards success work. But if I could add, there's one other dimension to this, which is they also neglected, these elites did, the need for identity and belonging and community and a politics of the common good. And so that left the way open a kind of moral emptiness, a void to be filled by hyper-nationalists. Explain this concept of common good, because you know it, it recurs in several of your books. You seem to suggest that the politicians of a particular type fail the common good. And you know, in the Indian context, yeah. it would be the grand old Congress party, which for yeah. years ruled the country in the name of the people, yeah. but failed the common good. Uh, and they've been now today, in a way, pigeonholed as the Latians elite. And you have the rise of a, of a new type of politics as a result. Uh, what is this common good that you believe uh, needed to be satisfied for liberal democracy to endure? It's an important question because the autocratic populists who tap into the politics of anger and resentment do assert a kind of unita unitary authoritarian notion, homogenizing notion of the common good. So it's tempting to say the common good is the problem. We need a politics of fair procedures, a kind of more technocratic politics that doesn't traffic in contested notions of the common good. That's dangerous. I think that response is a mistake. I think the better response is to articulate an alternative, more pluralistic conception of the common good. Because, well, let me take one step back if I could. For years, I've been critical of a kind of purely liberal, secular, technocratic approach to politics because I worried that it failed to speak to people's legitimate hunger for community, belonging, identity, patriotism, pride. These are all aspirations connected to a politics of the common good. Now, when mainstream or progressive or liberal political parties fail to articulate a sense of belonging and pride and patriotism and community that orient people in the world, then there is a dangerous vacuum that's created, dangerous because invariably it's filled, and we see this today around the world, that longing for meaning and community and for the common good will be filled by narrow, intolerant, fundamentalist or hyper-nationalist politics. And that's what we've seen in, in democracies around the world. But in a sense, therefore, are you saying that the only answer to the failure of liberal democratic politics is the rise of hyper-nationalists to fill this vacuum? I mean, the danger is the common good that you speak about. Yeah. Even the hyper-nationalists today say that we speak for the common good. Yes. Uh, yes. You know, that we are here to in a way, uh, ensure that every Indian will, uh, will be treated equally. We will give you the same benefits uh, that, that the elite privilege had. They also speak the language of the common good. They so, do. But they speak it through the language at times also of hate and bigotry. Yes. I'm going to strengthen community identity, Hindu identity in some other parts of the world and Islamic identity. So identity politics, Professor, is dangerous. It is. While you're pointing out the weaknesses in the liberal project, yes. are you in a way offering an alibi almost for the rise of hyper-nationalism? Not an alibi, Rajdeep, but an, a diagnosis. And there's an important difference between an alibi and a diagnosis. Identity politics is dangerous, and we've seen the dangers, and the dangers could deepen and worsen. But the answer to the dark forces that can be unleashed by identity politics, the hypernationalism and the ethnocentrism 
and the identification of community in, in, in negative terms, the solution to that is not to abandon the field of identity politics. It's not to abandon patriotism or community or belonging because politics has to, has to articulate a conception of what's shared, of common purposes and ends, of what holds us together as a society, of what sources of pride we can take in our tradition. And the real question is whether identity politics will be pluralistic and open to contestation and debate that's the healthy kind of identity politics. Or whether it will be given over entirely to the narrow, enclosed, negative, harsh, authoritarian definition that will result if pluralist, progressive forces don't identify for themselves an affirmative conception of what it is that holds societies together, of what we can take pride in, of, of what the common good actually means. So you're calling for a kind of citizen civic nationalism in yes, a way. Yes, yes. You know, which, wherein those in power uh, or those who wish to be part of power also have to, in a way, to use a term in your book, contributive justice. You've got to contribute to society. You've got to give back. You've got to respect people uh, at the bottom of the pyramid and reach out to yes. them, not just resort to slogans. Exactly, yes. And, and one of the, I think one of the most important human needs, one of the most fundamental human needs, is the need to be needed by one's fellow citizens, to feel that one's contributions, whether they be contributions made by people with fancy degrees, or by people who are import, making important contributions to our everyday lives without fancy educations. People want to feel that their contributions are recognized and respected and made the basis of dignity. And when that doesn't happen, the divide between winners and losers deepens and it comes to poison our politics and set us apart. And this is what I refer to as the tyranny of merit, which would otherwise seem a paradoxical idea. The tyranny of merit deepens the divide between winners and losers. In a sense, when you use that word tyranny of merit, yeah. what you're saying is that there are people who believe they've arrived, yeah. whether they're the Latians elite or the East Coast elite who believe, who've gone to a Harvard or right. uh, you know, went to St. Stephen's College right. and believed that they had arrived in the world. They haven't actually arrived because of necessarily their merit, but they've arrived perhaps because of networks and privileges, yeah. and they perhaps forgot that somewhere along the way, and thereby got disconnected with the people whom they claim to represent. Yes. Am I correct? Yeah, yes. It's the, in recent decades especially, we've seen this, Rajdeep, as, as globalization, has dispensed its rewards very unequally. We know that there have been, there's been a growing gap between uh, rich and poor, but that's not the only problem. The deeper problem has to do with the changing attitudes towards success that have accompanied the widening inequalities. Those who've landed on top have come to believe that their success is their own doing, the measure of their merit and that they therefore deserve the rewards and the influence and the power and the prestige associated with their own efforts. Here's another way of putting it. it the, the tyranny of merit describes the tendency of the successful to inhale too deeply of their own success, to forget the luck and good fortune that helped them on their way, and, by, and that leads to looking down, looking down on those who struggle. And those look down upon notice. They notice and they feel a loss of dignity. And that opens them to a backlash against elites. And that's what fueled the rise of Donald Trump. And you will tell me whether there is a certain parallel in India. I won't tell you about the parallels in India. Because that, uh, you know, that, that is for you to explore over time. But let, let, let's for a moment, uh, you know, 
look at it in the U.S. context because there are enough examples in this right. country as well. For example, during the 2016 presidential campaign in the U.S., uh, when Hillary Clinton used that famous term, basket of deplorables, to describe racist, homophobic, sexist backers of Trump, that remark may have cost her votes because Mr. Trump was then able to build on the angers and resentments of those who felt that Hillary Clinton was talking down to them. But at the end of the day, aren't the values that the liberals represent important enough? Are we saying that we should not sort of call out those who are xenophobic, those who are racist, those who, who in some way go against constitutional values? Should we not call out someone who's an outright bigot for being one? We should call out racists and xenophobes and bigots and misogynists. Yes, we should, but in calling them out, we should not comfort ourselves with the thought that the only reason that these voters don't support us is in virtue of their, for, in, for some, not all of them, racism and bigotry and xenophobia because that lets us, and here I'll use the term us broadly, it lets us off the hook too easily. It prevents us from engaging in a kind of critical self-examination about other aspects of our politics, mainly to do with the economy and with attitudes towards success, with our technocratic assumptions, our meritocratic hubris, not really connecting with the legitimate aspirations and not really connecting, not really addressing the legitimate grievances that are entangled with these dark uh, aspects of populist politics. So this is very difficult. It's not easy to disentangle the, the dark xenophobic aspects that draw people to authoritarian hypernationalist figures from the legitimate grievances about the loss of dignity that also animate the backlash. Do you, do you see what I'm suggesting? Yeah, and, and in a way, I, I, you know, it almost reflects also the arrogance yes. if they, or the hubris of the liberals uh, who seem to believe anyone with a different viewpoint is someone who necessarily should be condemned. The, the, you know, the, the could, problems could that people have today with a woke culture yeah. or a cancel culture, right. uh, you know, uh, is that it is also premised on a certain arrogance uh, of the old liberal elite. I mean, yes, I was just going to add, Rajdeep, that shortly after her uh, uh, election loss to Donald Trump, Hillary Clinton came to India and said, she had made her comment about the basket of deplorables earlier during the campaign. She said, I won the counties and cities that represent two-thirds of American GDP. I won the affluent, the prosperous, the diverse, the forward-looking. Well, she did, but she lost the election. But that's, that was the hubris, the, the Democratic Party traditionally was the party of working people, going back to the New Deal, of workers, of farmers, and representing the powerless against the privilege, reigning in corporate power and, and the power of privileged elites. By 2016, we had a Democratic Party candidate boasting about the fact that she had won the winners, the winners of globalization, and that Trump, though he prevailed, had won among the losers. More contentiously, and we can go back to your first visit to India 30 years ago, uh, which was just when liberalization was, when India was opening up, and today we are talking about the India moment, where seemingly there is a parallel between the rise of free market fundamentalist economics and the rise of in a way, a new form of political populism that almost as a reaction to this free market technocratic solutions that were being offered in this country as well through the 90s, you eventually had the rise of new forces who spoke about being culturally alienated, economically losing out. 
Is there a connection that you see that through the 90s and 2000s, leading up eventually to, uh, to the 2008 Lehman Brothers Wall Street collapse, post that, the world is looking for an anchor and strongmen populist leaders provide that in a manner that perhaps liberal Democrats could not because they failed the free market project. I think people, I think that whole experience of the last 40 years did leave people looking for anchors, for a sense of community, for a sense of belonging and pride in a shared common life. And that aspiration was hijacked by, <clears throat> by authoritarian, hypernationalist, populist uh, figures, in large part because for that previous four decades, those who presided over the market-driven version of globalization missed, the, missed something important. In arguing for the unfettered flow of capital across national borders, free trade agreements that would enforce intellectual property rights, that would allow the free movement of goods and capital and people across borders, there was a kind of heady confidence uh, in that moment, going back to the 1990s, that if only we allow markets free reign globally, and this was an American-led version of the globalization project, but it was embraced by many, especially elites throughout the world, then borders will matter less. National identities will matter less. New communications technologies will enable us to communicate with people halfway across the world as easily as our neighbor next door. Borders will matter less, and so we will be able to rise above these seemingly atavistic tendencies toward traditions, community, patriotism, national belonging. So the moment of market-driven globalization was more than an economic moment. It came with a certain political outlook that missed the importance of national identities, community, belonging. And it came along with a kind of hubris that said, all of that that you long for is backward. And eventually, we'll rise above it. And so it's no wonder that right-wing authoritarian hypernationalist parties can claim to be the patriotic parties. And then liberals and social democrats say, well, we're patriotic too, but it lacks conviction because it was these parties who presided over this project over four decades. No, Professor, right through your books, you also critique something which over the years, even in our constitution, we thought was our holy grail, individual liberties. That nothing matters more in a democracy than an individual's rights and liberties that he or she has. Now, in an era of muscular nationalism, of demagogic leaders, how do you then achieve this balance between individual liberties and the common good? What happens if the common good is weaponized by that authoritarian leader? He calls for compliance, for submission, for non-questioning. If I question the person, I'm called anti-national. How then? I mean, what, you know, it, it's all very well to say individual liberties should not be a holy grail. But do I have a choice between individual liberties on one side and someone else in the name of the common good saying you've got to comply and submit to my authority? That's the real danger, isn't it? It is, and actually, just a small but important correction, Rajdeep. I do think individual liberties are and should be a holy grail, but not to the exclusion of this other range of concerns that we've been discussing. Identity so you can't belonging. cut it off, you're saying you can't cut off individual liberties from a social context. Right. That you've got to keep them in the context of society yes. or being part of a wider community. Yes, every, every community will define for itself, ideally through open public debate, 
how exactly to define and enforce individual liberties. But, uh, and that will, ref different constitutions of, uh, different democratic constitutions define rights somewhat differently. But fundamental liberties such as freedom of speech, uh, public debate, freedom of the press, religious liberty, these are and should be a holy grail. So I don't want to be misunderstood on that. But we will only be able to define and to defend and to protect those liberties if we have a healthy public life, if we have a constitution with an independent judiciary that can go against what the government says. But for all of this, democracy has to be in good health. And what's worried me, and, and what I've written about, is not that we put too much uh, weight on individual liberties, it's that the lack of attention to community, to belonging, to patriotism, has discredited those of us who care about individual liberties and has empowered um, the hypernationalists to weaponize, as you put it, to weaponize the common good, which, which brings a threat to individual liberties. Let's turn from there then to the core question, which is we seem to be you know, in an age of competing intolerances, where we increasingly talk at each other, not yeah. talk to each other, even right. in WhatsApp groups. You know, people leave WhatsApp groups the moment there's an opinion which they don't approve of, they just walk out of a WhatsApp group. So you've got the liberals with their woke and their cancel culture. You've got the right wing with their visions of nationalism. Why are we, how are we going to fix this? How do you fix two groups that simply are unwilling to talk to each other or listen, a word that you often use in your books, yeah. to listen to each other? It isn't easy, Rajdeep, but I think we have to change the public culture of our societies. We have to change the civic culture. And this is a challenge that goes beyond politics. It bears on politics because the terms of public discourse have become so hollowed out that what passes for political discourse consists of shouting matches. And have, you watched, I, have you watched Indian TV at night? <laughs> <laughs> but go ahead. Um, shouting matches, ideological food fights among politicians, you know, you know about this better than I do. But the, the solution, and you mentioned listening. Listening is one of the great democratic arts. It's a civic art. It's one of the great missing civic virtues of our time. The ability to listen, by which I don't just mean hearing what somebody said and being able to repeat it or attack it. I mean listening for the moral convictions and principles and aspirations lying behind the views of those with whom we disagree. Now, how do we rebuild this capacity? Ultimately, well, the media has to help, and I think we have to reconfigure the media. We have to find alternatives to the version of social media that reinforces our division and our impatience and our distraction and our inability to listen. We need to design new tools and platforms for reasoned public discourse across our differences. And the way social media is set up now which depends on capturing and holding our attention through sensational, provocative, inflammatory uh, clickbait, that is deeply destructive of the kind of public culture we need. It certainly is destructive of the capacity to listen and to pay attention, because the whole economic model of, of it is to hold our attention for as long as possible, to gather more personal data about us, the better to sell us stuff through targeted ads. And that is a recipe for an impoverished uh, civic life and an impoverished public discourse. So that's one thing we have to change. And I think those of us in education have a responsibility too, 
to cultivate the kind of civic education that uh, equips democratic citizens with the art of listening and reasoning and arguing and attending to one another. Because listening to you uh, and picking up from what you said about social media, it seems to me that it'll be even more difficult to fix the problem and bridge the divides simply because with social media, hate and bigotry can be can be pushed in real time uh, yeah. at, at speeds which simply make it impossible to, to press the pause button. I mean, in this age of social media, in the age of some AI engineer and algorithm deciding what you will watch, I mean, the human mind has no chance. Well, that, that's quite, quite a phrase. I need to ponder that. Uh, <laughs> Rajdeep, the human mind has no chance. It's beginning to feel that way. I mean, even, I mean, put aside even the, the hate that is promulgated on social media, the commandeering of attention is itself a form of corruption. The commandeering of attention. Losing our ability to direct our attention to important things and having been constantly bombarded um, in ways that distract us. That's corruption. I'll give you one small example of how the meaning of time and attention changes. Well, you know this being in television, but years ago, as you mentioned in the introduction, Rajdeep, we did an experiment and filmed and put my entire uh, Harvard Justice course online, free, open access. We never imagined that tens of millions of people would watch lectures on philosophy online, but that's what happened. Now, these lectures, I don't know, they're probably a total of uh, roughly uh, 24 hours of lectures, something like that, an hour each. Just recently, I've been working on a new uh, kind of online course that people will take on their phones on tech ethics, actually. On tech ethics. Tech ethics, including all these debates about AI and algorithms and chat GPT. And uh, I'm told, I mean, the people organizing this say, no, you can't have our lectures. The, uh, each, each section, each lecture can be a maximum of 15 minutes, not an hour, but even that 15 minutes has to be broken up into bite-sized portions of no more than three minutes. No more than three minutes. Now, I'm trying to adapt to that because it's still better than what people are getting on social media and so on, but attention spans, really. The ability to attend is connected to the ability to listen and to reason. And so I think we have to reconsider education and the media if we're to seriously address the hollow state of our public uh, discourse and our public culture. You use this word hollowed public discourse on several occasions. Yeah. Give us an example of what you see as the hollowed public discourse. You spoke about the shouting matches right. that take place uh, right. uh, on, on, on TV. Yeah. Uh, uh, there's probably Twitter with, with all the noise that it creates. Uh, is there a way, do you see, what will it take to lift the quality of this hollowed public discourse apart from the art of listening? Well, I think we have to reconsider the economic model that enforces this um, economy of distraction, which is a way of describing the, the hollowing force. And there have been proposals to uh, either tax or ban targeted online advertising. And I think we should seriously consider this because, now this would not mean that there can be no social media, but there can be no Instagram and Twitter and TikTok, I suppose, is yet another matter. But, but it would mean that they would have to sell subscriptions or find some other way of financing it and that would provide less of an incentive to promote uh, hateful or sensationalistic or inflammatory 
clickbait in order to draw us in, in order to hold us. Uh, so I think we need to look at structural alternatives to the way social media is funded. That would, do you find that shocking or are you sympathetic to that idea? Uh, Ban targeted online advertising? I'm okay as long as uh, it means more people come and watch the news on TV. <laughs> I see. Uh, but, I see. But, but Professor, you know, it, I love the word eco economy of distraction because right. that's exactly what it is. Right. I want to turn back to where we started off, where you said the failure of the liberal project had led to these anger and resentment, which eventually leads to the rise of uh, populist politics. Uh, however, in the context of justice, uh, you know, while angers and resentments over present conditions of the working class, of the middle class, is also being linked to past animosities. In the US, when Trump came to power, he promised to put up walls that would shut out immigrants. Right. For example, uh, in India, we've had the rise of a majoritarian politics that says that you know, if a mosque was demolished 500 years ago, or a temple was demolished 500 years ago, we will make sure that the temple is restored. The mosque, which was in its place, uh, gives way to the temple. Uh, these notions of justice based on the past, of correcting past animosities, uh, of, uh, of uh, discrimination against blacks in America or against castes in India based on past uh, instances, do you believe that anger, those resentments, need to also be looked at uh, in, in, in the context of justice? Well, it's interesting as you've described it beautifully. The question of justice can't really be separated from the politics of memory. Because it's tempting to think, and perhaps it will always be tempting to assume that doing justice is bound up with memory. And sometimes the memories reach back, as you've said, a very long way. And sometimes memories of past wrongs and past injustice can be disabling or hardening of current divisions especially when they're weaponized. The question is whether, so one solution would be to try to sever the link between justice on the one hand and the memory of past wrongs on the other. But that too would be a mistake, I think, because justice does require that we address past wrongs. In the US today, we are having searching debates about how this generation can address the injustice of slavery and of racial segregation that continue to shadow our collective life in the present. So the solution is not simply to forget the past and to set aside memory of past wrongs. We have to, and this is parallel to the discussion we had about the common good, whether the best protection for ind individual liberties is to leave aside questions of identity. I think that's a mistake. Just as I think it would be a mistake to pursue justice by saying, let's forget about the past. Now, you rightly said that identity politics is dangerous. So is the politics of memory dangerous, as we see today. But the response to that danger is to have an open, contested, respectful, civil discussion about the past and about memory and about the obligations that past wrongs carry for those of us who have some maybe distant responsibility for them or our community did. And so here I guess is a thread that's run through the challenges you've rightly put to me. 
we can't do without a politics of the common good, even though it can be weaponized. Likewise, we can't do without a politics of memory, even though it can harden into dangerous terms. So what, what a pluralist democratic politics needs is a way of engaging with the past, not forgetting it, and a way of articulating the common good, not renouncing it. That's the only way that a pluralist democratic society will save itself from the weaponized conception of the common good and of memory that afflicts democracy today. And therefore, Professor, that was brilliantly put, first of all. Uh, you know, I think uh, you've given us plenty of food for thought, but I want to throw up one final question because you've come to India at a time when our parliament is wrestling over whether democracy in this country is alive or dead based on what the opposition seems to suggest. Purely from your vantage viewpoint outside India, uh, do you see democracy in India in some kind of a crisis or do you believe democracy is, uh, you know, can't be, uh, is in a, in a country like India is too deep rooted to be dismantled in the manner that some fear. Should we be conscious of, of democracy being under threat, under siege? Or do you believe democracy in India is open, vibrant, from your perspective, from an American perspective? My view as a, a sympathetic and deeply interested outsider is that um, democracy in India is deeply rooted and under threat, both, both at the same time. And I would say, and I say this, as someone coming from a democracy where we had an attack on the US Capitol in the aftermath of an election. So I think democracy is in danger, under threat, in, in our countries, in India and in the US, and in many countries around the world, which is not to say that democracy is without sources of rejuvenation. And I would just add, Rajdeep, that the fate, many people looked to the January 6th invasion of the Capitol and said, if that can happen in the United States, democracy is, could be in trouble everywhere. And they, they were right to say that. Um, I would add that the flourishing and the success and the revival of democracy um, in, the, in the most populous democratic country in the world is something in which we all, all of us, have a stake. And so, uh, so I wish you well as, as you all think through these, these challenges to democracy. Well, Professor, let me say that, that we wish you well as well. Uh, and uh, I think what you've done in the last 40 minutes is given us the ability to listen. Uh, I haven't seen an audience so silent in a long time, and fewer and fewer people were looking at their mobiles to find out which was the last WhatsApp message they got. So in a strange way, Professor, I think the biggest tribute to you is that in today's day and age, you've held an Indian audience to complete silence. And that's because you've given us plenty of food for thought. Thank you very much, Professor uh, Sandel, because uh, democracy is what binds the India, India, what binds India and the United States and hopefully will keep bringing you back to this country. Thank you very much. Thank you. Professor Sandel from Harvard University. Thank you. Thanks Ladies and gentlemen, please raise a warm applause for the professor while I call upon Mr. Frank Schloder, Managing Director, Hefel, South Asia, to come up on stage and present a small token of our appreciation to the gentleman. Thank you, Professor. Once again, ladies and gentlemen, that was a thought-provoking session. Do raise a warm applause for Professor Sandel. Thank you, Mr. Salgusai. Thank you.
with that, uh, we are down to our last four big sessions um, of the evening. One of them is going to be happening on the sidelines. I'm going to let you know later. But uh, let's quickly get on to our next session this evening. Machine Gods, AI and Creation Myths. How to think about the new worlds and being brought into existence. What to celebrate, what to fear. This session has been brought to you by Kirloskar. To take it from here, I want to invite on stage our session's moderator, Shoma Chaudhary, Consulting Editor, India Today. Good evening. That was a riveting session that just finished and a perfect segue into the session that we're going to have now which is about the most disruptive technology that has entered all our lives. We're really at a threshold moment, perhaps something that we are not even really cognizant of at this point. But those who are in the heart of it, and in fact, the founder of the company of whose CEO we are just going to speak with, he said that the technology that's just been unleashed is equivalent to Prometheus's fire. And all of us are familiar with that myth where Prometheus steals fire, which literally is the origin of all knowledge. So it's, it sounds hyperbolic, but it possibly is that. And at the alternate end of that is Elon Musk, who equates it with something as dangerous or possibly more dangerous than nuclear weapons. What we're talking about is the new generative AI technology that hit the world in just four months ago, around November, December is when it entered popular consciousness, and it's been moving at the speed of light since then. Just going to throw you a couple of facts before I invite the speaker on stage. The World Economic Forum put out a report which said generative AI in the next, when you say 2030, it sounds far away, let's remember it's just six or seven years ago, is going to displace 40% of human jobs as we know it. They say it's 86 million jobs. McKinsey put out a report 